Divine Choice Book Group. These are discussions of books selected by Jesus and Mary. This book group discusses Through the Mists by Ephra and Robert James Lees. This is Chapter 17, A Poetess at Home. Hosts of this discussion are Mary and Jesus. This discussion was held on the 23rd of April 2014 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 1, Part 1. Hi, today we're discussing Chapter 17 of the book Through the Mists, channeled by Robert James Lees, and this is a continuation of our book group series. I'm here with Jesus mm -hmm. um, and discussing a chapter that I feel really passionate about. Yeah. So let's commence. So welcome everyone. Hope you enjoy our discussion. Yes. I think I will. <laughs> I don't know much about it yet at all. <laughs> Well, I think you've read this book so many times, you yeah, kind of know it, but, yeah. <laughs> but perhaps haven't read it recently. No, no. no, I haven't read this chapter recently, no. Yeah. Mm. So just to recap a little bit on our story, mm -hmm. um, Fred has gone through this uh, realisation of all of his sleep state experience. Mm. And he went to this place called the college where he encountered these young orphan boys and girls who were about to pass, a lot of them, but this is where they spend their sleep state. And the latest one who's about to pass is called Limpy Jack. Mm -hmm. And Arvis, uh, who is sort of a spirit who assists young children to pass, mm -hmm. has, um, has come to take Limpy to see his new home in mm -hmm. the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the last chapter, we left them and they were flying over these beautiful cities. Mm -hmm. And so um, let's proceed with mm -hmm. the story. Yeah. So... They actually come to arrive at a place and um, it's not in any city, it's on this beautiful slope mm. and this is going to be the place of Limpy's new home, mm. uh, as Fred discovers. Mm. Uh, and there's a beautiful description right there at the start of the chapter uh, where he says that um, we reached a range of hills which seemed to be clothed with all the fragrance and the glory of hope's ideal fruition, which I, is such a beautiful description mm. of uh, imagine a place where hope's ideal has come to fruition. Mm. Uh, I like the way he says a lot of these things, isn't it? It's like all through these books, there's this, it's almost like reading poetry while you're reading sentences. Yeah. And... Uh, he must have spent a lot of time compiling <laughs> and recompiling this to, to try to put, uh, portray the, the sensation and the feelings associated with what he felt mm. into words in the English language so that we could read it and, be, and then have all this imagery created inside of us as to what, what he was getting at. You know? Yeah, mm. definitely. Do you think he rewrote it or he just reached a place where he could convey that no i feel with the earlier books uh i th feel we'll talk to him about the first book after we finished and but the i feel with the earlier books because he wasn't yet at one with god when he wrote them and penned them with robert james lees he did go through a process of re hashing them re-editing mm. them and going over you know what what material they included and what material they left out and then how to describe everything in such a way where he could he could portray the feelings and the emotions that he was feeling while he was going through these experiences. And I felt he took a lot of care in that mm. process. Now, when he wrote the last book, The Gate of Heaven, obviously that would have been a natural thing for him to do. So that would have probably been an easier book for him to write sure. in some ways, but uh, because of his own development. But the first two books, because of his development at the time, he would have had to think very clearly about you know, what he was expressing and how he was expressing it. And to have so much poetry in the first book is an indication that he spent quite a deal of time, I feel, getting the... Getting it right. Getting it right. Yeah. So that when we read it, we got the feeling of it mm. rather than just the thoughts of it. Mm. Yeah, what I like in each chapter, really, there is such a strong theme or a number of really strong themes. Mm. And the language and the poetic way in which it's described mm. often reinforces the theme three and four and five times throughout the chapter. Mm. And in this chapter, there's a very strong theme about progression mm -hmm. and what is true progression. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of themes surrounding faith and hope. And 
also humility. Uh, the poetess whose home he is reaching now, um, he has a long interaction with her and she displays a lot of beautiful qualities. And there's this theme about love and, again, the comparison between uh, earth-based ideas and religion and the truth about, about the spirit world. And mm. it's all sort of woven in, as you say, with all this poetic language. But it's a theme that sort of re-emerges as they have a different part of the discussion and even towards the end of the chapter. Uh, where Mahanin comes back, that it again, and we'll get to we'll discuss it all individually, mm, but mm. again these themes come back. And so mm. I feel he has done a beautiful job at just creating these really succinct lessons mm. in each chapter and ones that build upon each other as well, yeah, which sure. was obviously his experience. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, he, here Fred is and he's arrived at this place and... At the moment, he doesn't know whose place it is, but he sees this beautiful home um, near the foot of a mountain mm. on a gentle slope. Mm. And he says something very beautiful about the nature there. And I thought um, I might just read that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He said, um, nature, it was like a realised dream in which some weary painter, musician or poet had sought and found rest. So this is the place. Nature herself had been the gardener of the landscape lying before us. I do not mean the unkept, entangled and disordered nymph with which earth calls nature, scattering weeds and briars and thistles in wild confusion all around, but the beauteous angel who, timid at the result of man's disobedience, withdrew with all her kindred host to heaven where she could perfect her handicraft Unmolest, in unmolested freedom, and and it goes on, but uh, I thought that was a very beautiful reflection about nature and how mm. um, often it is misconceived here on Earth as something wild and to be to be hemmed in and overtaken. Hey, mm. and part of the reason why that is too is because most people on Earth don't realise that because of our soul condition and what we do to the Earth, weeds, briars, and thistles have to seed in order to fix up the problems that we've created with the earth so the reason why we have such such parts of nature if you like the weeds the briars the thistles the thorny mm -hmm. parts of nature is mostly because any other parts of nature we usually go in there and destroy anyway and it's only the weeds the briars and the thistles that have any ability to survive in the environment we've created for them yep. whereas in this environment Obviously, weeds, briars and thistles don't any longer need to be created to recover the soil or recover the environment. And, and, and instead, you have the other plants, which are, which are the plants that demonstrate the beauty of the location there. Mm. And I feel that's possible on Earth. It's just that, unfortunately, we've done so much damage to the Earth that we need the weeds and briars and thistles in order to recover it. Yeah. Um, but obviously in this location where this lady, as we work out, is mm -hmm. existing, um, she doesn't need those things to be recovered anymore. They're already recovered. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, it, and that's really what uh, is implied, isn't it? That mm. the full beauty of nature or the full potential of nature has almost retreated from the earth or it's not present on the earth yes. because of man's, uh, humankind's... Um, attitude and destruction towards it. Hey? Correct. Yeah, there's still like billions and billions of different types of seeds that can't even really survive of plants that can't survive on earth because of the condition of the earth itself that we have imposed upon the earth. And, uh, and once we've stopped imposing these, this kind of condition upon the earth, then a lot of those kind of bushes and shrubs and trees that are, that are all recovery plants they will all slowly disappear. The seeds will remain in the ground for some future event should there need to be recovery from. But, uh, but all the other beautiful plants that, that we don't see much of anymore in reality, mm. they will all be able to come up and, and start to assert themselves and become do the dominant plants that we see, mm. which is the location that we see here. Yeah. They, they are all the dominant plants and there are no briars and thistles and thorns <laughs> and, and weeds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it also shows a lot, doesn't it, about our arrogance in believing that we can create something more beautiful than God's already made provision for, hey? Yes, yeah. yeah. And the reality, too, is that the plants of the earth are reflecting our condition. They're reflecting the damage that we do. 
And once we stop doing damage, obviously those particular plants don't need to continue. The seeds will remain, but they don't need to continue to thrive. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to thrive in their current environment because it's the only way that the current environment can be recovered. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. OK. Um, so he's in a very beautiful place. Mm. <laughs> and as, as they arrive there, this lady approaches, who he recognise, uh, who Frederick recognises from having has having known from his sleep state experiences. Mm. And Can I rewind a little though? Sure. I just like one. There's one sentence that I feel is just like yeah. a very, like, again a very descriptive sentence that I feel um, demonstrates how much care Fred has taken in the writing of this book. Mm -hmm. He says, "Before me lay the natal bowers of beauty, enchantment, harmony." grace and rhythm, each of whom held court in one or other of the hundred odious halls of grove odorous, or yeah. odorous halls of grove or hill or mountain pass. Yeah. So he's just and he, he labels each one of those things with capitals like as if it's a as if it's a person or, or, or it's a yeah, it's an entity. <laughs> an entity yeah. almost. Yeah. Um, demonstrating that how nature, particularly in the spirit world, nature is used in such a way that it inspires emotion in the person who beholds it. Yeah. And this is one of the things too I feel that we miss a lot on earth. Because the nature is in recovery mm -hmm. on earth most of the time, it's rare for us to be in a location where the nature itself inspires emotion within us. Yeah. But in the spirit world that is a very common thing for, for nature to inspire uh, emotional responses in, mm. the, in the person observing. It's really part of well, God created everything in order to help us explore our soul and experience ourselves. Correct. And so this, this power and beauty and all of these grace and rhythm that are inherent in nature as God created it, mm. we miss out on a lot of that. Even, even in the times when we feel most inspired by nature, we're still not experiencing it to, as, to the level that God uh, intended exactly. because of the conditions on the earth. Yeah. yeah. So there's, no, there's actually no place on earth that would mirror the location where the poetess exists yeah, yeah. Uh, at the moment. Yeah. But there's no reason why that can't change yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, as I said, I could actually discuss just about every of course, sentence yeah, no. in this chapter because I just feel um, it's all just so beautiful and there's so much, like even this section on nature, I feel we could talk about for an mm. hour mm. because it, just the description and if we delve into the like the significance as you were just starting to do of what mm. this scene represent like how it came to be the the condition that they're in the level mm. of the spirit world there's so much we could say isn't mm. there there is um, and and again we can't assume that every place in the spirit world is like this no. this is a place in the spirit world where you have to have some love mm -hmm. to be to be developed enough to exist yeah. and and it's the top of the first sphere so it's a it's a place where you know, there is quite a lot of love available and, and sort of on the borderland of the second sphere. So mm -hmm. it's all, it's a place where, um, where the average place on earth is not going to look no. like, like this. But it, we have the potential of it looking like this if our collective condition changed. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. And well, that's a good segue because actually Limpy Jack, he's going to enter the spirit world at this place. Mm. And uh, in the next passage I was thinking we could discuss, it talks about the fact that his time in his sleep state and at the college has actually um, helped him elevate his condition. It mm -hmm. has educated him in a way mm -hmm. that he can actually enter the spirit world at this location. Mm -hmm. So um, again, if I just read a part of this. Mm -hmm. So Jack finds this poetess, it's, it's her home mm -hmm. and he's recognised her and he, he, he runs to her. He's quite excited that mm. he, you know, he's going to live there. There was no shyness or vulgarity in his demeanour, this child of the gutter. For had not the sleep part of his life been given to educating and preparing him for the duties and pleasures of this home? And though the alternate circumstances of his waking state had compelled him to assume a low disguise, his royal antecedents had been discovered and his right was undisputed now. 
He was the son of a king brought home from exile. <laughs> there were no inquiries as to where he had wandered and what his associates and position had been even though he had found and through his visits could be but transient for a brief space, all knew that his absence could never again be for long. Mm. It's a beautiful statement, that statement, isn't it, that he was the son of a king brought home from exile. Very beautiful, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I suppose there's a biblical metaphor in that uh, statement. Mm. Um, would you be able to explain to us the biblical metaphor? Is that a bit embarrassing for you? <laughs> I can try, but I just need to have a little <laughs> collect myself a bit. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> well, in reality, all of us are sons of the king. And the king is God, obviously. And we are all just sons and daughters of the king. And that's how God sees us. And that's the special place that each of us holds in God's heart. But unfortunately, some of us have walked so far away from that place or are so much in denial of that place that we, we can't even recognise that we're sons of any king. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot easier for children to recognise such. There is no... Generally, there is far less worry about the facade in the child. And of course, here it demonstrates that there was no facade in him. Yeah. And, and as a result, uh, on earth... Um, although he was treated poorly on earth by the average person, in, in the spirit world, he was treated like he was the son of a king. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and the reality is, in the spirit world, every single person who arrives in the spirit world is treated like a son of a king. This yeah. king. Uh, just most of us are not aware of it. And, and it's not until we get up near the top of the first sphere in our development that we start to become aware of the fact that we are a son of God or a daughter of God and therefore do deserve to be treated well. Mm. Uh, up until that time, most of the time, we believe that we, we deserve to be treated badly. And most of us have very poor self-esteem and poor self-worth. And as a result, we have a tendency to believe that we should be treated badly. And, and most children don't have that to, to a large degree. Where they, they, don't, they don't feel they should be treated any way at all, you mm. know, badly or good generally, particularly in the way that this little child has been brought up. Of course, nowadays, most children rule the roost of their homes. <laughs> yeah. And of course, they uh, are in a darker condition as a result, where they do have expectations that they're treated well. But uh, from God's perspective, we are still all just sons and daughters of the king. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I suppose um, I, I see that there's a transition that each of us make in our progression where we come to see ourselves as sons and daughters of God. And a lot of time before that, we see ourselves as sons and daughters of people on earth and we don't have a sense of worth or a sense of God. And because of that, we often feel pretty bad and, and there isn't that condition. Like it is a certain condition that this young boy has reached in his sleep state mm. um, that is allowing him to sort of come home from this exile, if you like, of a harsh, harsh life, life on, on earth. earth. But then the harsh life on earth was completely different to what he, given his condition, completely different to what he would have been treated if he, if he was in the spirit world. Yeah. Um, and this is the contrast. So for him, it's going to be, a bit of a surprise in the sense that he, he won't, you know, everything will be special because, yeah. he, because at her, on earth everything was a hardship yeah. and he lived a life on earth, a very short life on earth where everything was a hardship and, and as a result did not feel like he was special in anybody's eyes mm. and, and yet here in the spirit world, here he's getting treated specially uh, mm. on a number of different levels like Avarez, who's the angel taking him, is a very well developed spirit um, all the people who are involved in the education, his education are all very developed spirits, much more developed than the average person who passes over the spirit world. So he's given special attention just because he's the son of the king, as are all people who mm-hmm. pass. But of course, most people who pass reject attention initially, reject any kind of teaching, mm-hmm. reject any kind of uh, improvement in themselves. 
And so that's why the, for the average person who passes, this kind of thing doesn't happen. Yeah. It does happen for the average child who passes, mm -hmm. or particularly the average child who's treated badly. Yeah. It does happen, but, uh, but it doesn't happen for the average person who passes, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, because either there's a state of arrogance that's in the soul of the adult, uh, which prevents them feeling any gratitude or receiving gifts mm. and teaching, as you said, or mm. there's a sense of extreme low worth and desire to treat oneself badly and, and so treat that, others badly unfortunately yeah and so that prevents this kind of experience yes. yeah yes um, but it's very beautiful that it's really saying that even though um, he might visit again briefly everyone knows now that he's coming he's 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 going to pass and this this is like his homecoming, this wrecking, this is where my new home will be. And mm. yep. There is a lot of metaphor as this uh, chapter progresses about yourself. Mm. And that's why I asked you if you'd be embarrassed to discuss the <laughs> son of a king. Because in a lot of Christian teaching, you are viewed as the king. And, uh, yes, which is obviously not true. And it's not, yeah. what, my, um, it's not what Afra is referring no. to. No, but... If we keep that in mind as we go on, mm. because it would be good to have you um, just talk about some of the biblical metaphor. Mm. And, and I've, again, this is about visiting a poetess's home, mm -hmm. and poets often use metaphor to convey deep feeling. Mm -hmm. And in reading this chapter, I feel that it is all about appealing to the emotion of the reader mm. uh, and having them understand these beautiful concepts of progression and faith and and where this poetess is in her soul progression. Mm. And so I feel a lot of the biblical metaphor is used for the reader with a Christian background mm. to appeal to them to understand really what she's saying. Yes. And so, um, yeah. Yep. So let's progress. Yep. Let's go on. Uh, so everyone's very happy. <laughs> yes, of course. And, um, Another new arrival. The new arrival. Yep. But actually... Uh, Limpy Jack has to leave uh, pretty soon. To go uh, back right to his body. Now, yep. To go back to his body. Uh, and the tearing cough that was rapidly snapping the cords of his life. So mm. the illness that is coming upon him on, in, on earth, mm. uh, which means that he's imminently going to pass. Mm. So, mm. Um, and Frederick again talks about this contrast between the earth and mm. the sleep state. Mm. And he says something interesting here because he's appealing to the reader directly. Some of you are going to say, why don't we remember this sleep state? And he says this, because you have been schooled to think and still foster the idea that all dreams are the vagaries of the brain and that the sleep life is a myth and fantasy. Mm. God gave to Solomon the promise of his wisdom in a dream and used the same means to bid Joseph to take the child Jesus into Egypt. And if he changes not, he uses the same vehicle now. But ye despise them, then charge your folly upon God. <laughs> this is my answer back to your why. Mm. So if we can explain that mm. um, paragraph a little. Frederick's referring to a number of um, examples that are given in the Bible mm. about, so after your birth, uh, Joseph, your father, had a dream that said, mm -hmm. you need to take this kid to uh, Egypt mm -hmm. um, because he's in danger. Mm. And that really did happen, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And can you tell us about what God said to Solomon? Because I'm um, just versed in... Well, Solomon, uh, apparently, the, well, the, again, it's a legend more than... Uh, that is recorded in the Bible, but... Basically, Solomon, in a dream, it was given the chance to ask for anything he wished for, and he decided to ask for wisdom. And the, the statement in the Bible is, behold, when he woke up, he became wise. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, basically, God gifted him the ability to, of discernment and wisdom mm -hmm. to help him as a king to determine what he should do in matters of judgment. Of course, it didn't always help him very well, <laughs> unfortunately, in Solomon's case, because he was known to have like uh, something like 700 concubines and 300 wives. And <laughs> so that... <laughs> I don't think that's yeah. very wise. <laughs> but, uh, it sounds like a headache. A, yeah, <laughs> bound, to, bound to cause a lot of trouble in your life, um, which Solomon did eventually have in uh -huh. his life with, with his family and his children. But 
but there were t he was renowned in matters of judgment for being quite wise, and this is because he was quite often inspired, both in his dreams and in his awake life, inspired by spirits to give sound judgment. Mm -hmm. And when he was open to that, he would actually give that judgment. So, so in every in in so many aspects in the Bible, it's indicated that spirits talk to people, give them give them guidance. Now, of course, most religious people who believe, Christian religious people, believe that God does that directly to them, and that's not, not the case. This is God doing it via spirits to, uh, to people on earth, because the people on earth themselves cannot connect directly to God. Um, but unfortunately, most Christians sort of see it as either God or the devil doing it. Yeah. And it's not. There is a ra large range of people in the spirit world who all have the ability and option to speak with you. And depending upon your own condition, will, will depend upon what kind of messages you finish up receiving and acting upon. Mm -hmm. But it is all inspiration of one type or another. Inspiration to do the wrong thing or, <laughs> or an evil thing or inspiration to do something that may protect your life. And of course, you know, this is the kind of inspiration that's been around forever. Like ever, God created the laws that allow it to be in operation and it's been there at, at all times. Mm -hmm. But interesting, like the interesting statement mm -hmm. is the majority of people on earth completely deny the idea and recollection of it and then blame God for not giving them, more giving them any more information. <laughs> yeah. and, that, and this is where we find it quite ironic because, because on one hand, the earth, people on earth are often crying out for information, crying out for truth, crying out for what to do in any given situation. But there are so many means of inspiration and so many means of teachings that can, they can receive but they refuse them all because they say there's no such thing as any life after death anyway. Mm. So what's the point of listening to all of that? That's all just crap. Yeah. And it is amazing how many people say this to us, media people in particular. Um, you know, as soon as you start talking about a life after death, the average person on the planet basically thinks you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, for the people who do believe in life after death on the planet, they have very, very fixed ideas about what life after death is actually like. And what I love about these books is it explains that it's a much more wider experience yeah. Yeah. than the average Christian or Muslim or any other religious person would actually think is possible. Yeah. And you would expect that if you, if you were logical. You would expect that a God with wide-ranging knowledge and power would create a system that allows you to have a continuous experience even after your physical body has passed. Yeah. And also would enable that experience based on what God wishes to teach you about love yeah. and that all makes logical sense but unfortunately most people when they analyse life after death they're not very logical mm -hmm. and instead they are very judgmental mm -hmm. and as a result they shut down all of the abilities to know what's going on after their death and then they even go there's no such thing as a life after death and then of course that causes all sorts of problems within itself. Yeah. Uh, problems such as us acting out of harmony with love when we're alive because we're afraid of death. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we knew these things were available to us after death, then I doubt whether we'd be as afraid of it, with the exception that we'd be probably a bit more afraid about uh, the choices we make in this life that are unloving. <laughs> Which is something that Frederick urges us to consider of many times throughout this book. Yes. To think, think about what you're doing. Yes, um, because it has an effect it on has your an future effect. life. And he, he's so passionate about letting us know that, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I like that he... Um, he appeals to logic in that paragraph that I just uh, mm. quoted mm. because he says, and if he changes not, speak, referring again to God, if God doesn't change, he uses the same vehicle now as he did with Joseph and with Solomon. Yeah. And this is the very same point that Robert James Lees uses in his preference mm. to this book, that mm. this modern, in his day, the modern idea that many Christians had that the gifts of the Spirit were gone mm. um, and that it w and many Christians these days believe the gifts of the Spirit are, as you said, just coming directly from God. But Robert James Lees was saying, well, hang on, you've got all those prophets in the Bible. They were talking to spirits and talking to God. Why is it that 
it's not accepted anymore. Mm. And this is the same point really that Frederick's making here. Yes. Um, why don't you apply that logic that if yes. it happened then, why can't it happen now? And he's basically saying that the sad fact is that it doesn't happen much anymore because the average person on earth has completely denied the possibility of it happening. And of course, if you completely deny the possibility of something happening, then it's certainly not going to happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Absolutely. it's pretty, pretty unusual for yeah. it to happen to you, at least anyway, without some major event occurring. I also find it quite sad in a way, because in a way we're blaming God for what is our folly, like okay. he says here. But also there is this sad thing occurring in the religious world on earth that basically is is limiting what is what are the potentials of man's experience based upon theological doctrine yeah. and and unfortunately because of these limitations placed from these the, the, theologians which are basically in, uh, all to do with interpretation. It's not, yep. you know, you can read your Bible a completely different way and you'll see that there's channeling and mediumship going on all the way through <laughs> yes. it. Like every single prophetic book is a channeled material from someone, yep. from some spirit, you know. Of course, they claim it's an angel, yep. but uh, it is from some spirit. And there's plenty of, there's plenty of uh, times in the Bible, in the, in the Greek scriptures of the Bible, you know, with regard, particularly with regard to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, where it's recorded that I spoke to different spirits mm -hmm. of, in different conditions, you mm -hmm. know, some in the hells of the spirit world and some in other conditions. So the implication is quite clear in most of the holy books. And yet, for some reason, everyone thinks it has to be a special person that does that. And this is, a, this is very sad. Like, you know, you have to be a Muhammad or a Jesus before you can do that. Yeah. And, or, or Solomon or some famous person from the Bible. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, that's not true at all. And, and it's so sad that the average person believes that because they then preclude themselves from being engaged in this kind of education. And it also, I feel, it, um, it creates a problem with discernment. Mm. If, for example, people believe, oh, it's all coming directly from God, then there's not much discernment about the message you're receiving. Correct. So if God you tells you to kill somebody, so you go, oh, that's coming from God, so I should go and do that. <laughs> and there are people yeah. who do that, yeah. not thinking that, no, God wouldn't tell me to kill anybody. Mm -hmm. And so this message can't be coming from God, even though it's claiming to mm -hmm. come from God. You know. And if we had the information that actually all we have a spirit state experience and that spirit mediumship happens with people who might be angels or they might be just people who lived on earth before, mm. then we'd exercise much more discernment just as we exercise discernment with the people in front of us in the physical form. Correct. And that would lead to much more benefit to the earth, I believe. Yes. Much more learning and much less confusion about what God's really saying because God yes. does seem to contradict himself if it is... God speaking to all these Christians yes. at, or, or various other people, I should yes, well, there's plenty of people who come along to our seminars who come up to us and say, oh, I've channeled my celestial, you know, guardian and, and he says this and he says that. We go, you're not speaking to a celestial spirit. You're speaking to a spirit in the hells who's manipulating you. Yeah. And they go, no, that can't be possible. They use all the words, right, you know. Yeah. No, it's got nothing to do with the words. Feel their condition. Yeah. And if you can't feel the condition of the people who are talking to you, then you're going to have a deep amount of trouble finding out who's working in your benefit, who's working towards you know, helping you to love, mm -hmm. and who's working to destroy you and destroy your faith and destroy yeah. the love that's in your yeah. soul. And in, unless you're sensitive in some way, you, you won't know. But there's plenty of people who come along to our seminars who believe they're talking to celestial spirits when they're not talking to anyone close to a celestial spirit yeah. um, and and we often tell them that and they go you know get all upset with us and get you know get all bitter and twisted about it but the reality is if they were sensitive to the emotions of the person they would be able to feel mm -hmm. who's speaking to them mm -hmm. and then they would know and they would also be able to verify it in their sleep state mm. <laughs> even mm. because yeah. we deny all of those things we generally don't verify these matters yeah mm. and and going back to what you said earlier about um, a lot of us reject and deny this sleep state experience and you said that then we blame God but actually and um, 
this is a theme throughout the book, if we exercised faith that such things were possible, mm. then we would have the ability to explore and understand it much more. Exactly. Yeah. And we wouldn't be so frightened of it. You know, the reality is there has been plenty of people historically who have tried to make us frightened of communication with spirits. Yeah. And there are, they have reasons for doing so. And any time anybody tries to make us frightened, it's generally because they want to manipulate and control us in some way. Mm -hmm. And so there's plenty of people in the spirit world and on earth who wish to manipulate and, and control us. And any time a person says, oh, you better be, you know, you're talking to the devil. Well, all that, the devil doesn't exist for a start, but, but the threat that you're talking to the devil, um, and while you may be talking to some very dark spirits, I'm not saying that that might not be the case, who are like devils, you know, in terms of how evil they are, and in fact, many people on earth are talking to exactly those spirits. And um, it doesn't mean that that's the only potential yeah. with regard to this kind of communication. So you don't, it's like, you don't get rid of a knife just because sometimes it's used to murder somebody. Mm -hmm. You get, you use a knife to cut up your veggies and, you know, prepare your meals and so forth. And you use it to cut things and things that you need to prepare and even things that you might need to work on outside. You use to cut with a knife and you use it as a tool for benefit mm -hmm. or you can use it as a tool to destroy yeah. and it's the same goes with every tool that God's given us and every gift that God's given us we can either use it to our benefit or we can use it to destroy ours or other people's lives mm -hmm. and it, and our intention will determine yes that's the result our aspiration our intention our will it's all of these very important qualities of the soul isn't yes. it that, yes that impact and I, we talked about that in one of the previous chapters about how that even impacts on where we are in the sleep state yes. and what's happening around us. Yes. Yeah. So if we have a truly loving intention and not an addictive intention or some manipulation or control as an intention, then of course we've got a, a, pure, a pure desire to act in harmony with love. Then, then experimenting with every one of these things is a good thing. Mm -hmm. You tend to learn a lot of things if you have that pure desire. Of course, most people need to purify their desire because most of our desires on earth are very impure. Um, and that's what our, where our problem begins. Yeah. It begins with ourselves. The fact that we have impure desires causes impure attractions, it causes addictive and codependent attractions, which include attractions with the spirit world and therefore a, dis a destruction of our condition. Mm -hmm. um, so there is no need to be afraid of these things. There's certainly a need to be circumspect and a need to be careful, mm -hmm. but there's no need to be afraid. These yeah. are all gifts given by God and are gifts given to us to give us faith actually mm -hmm. to help us have faith that there is an afterlife that there is a there, there is something coming after we die or after we finish this physical existence and we need to be just as concerned about what we're going to do once we pass as we are about what we're doing right now mm -hmm. because what we're doing right now does affect what we'll be able to do once we pass yeah yeah, yeah. And that theme's all the way through, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm. So if we move on now, um, Frederick begins to discuss the poetess. Yes. And uh, why she's such a special person for him. Mm -hmm. And he says, Had not her poems been almost my only companions in the solitude of my earth life? She had seemed to understand life as I knew it, with its deep soul longings and unalleviated heartaches like an almost kindred soul. But she had conquered and found a calm for which I vainly searched. Uh, and so this poetess had written poems while he was on earth, while Frederick was on earth, mm -hmm. that, that seemed to embodies a lot of the sadness and struggle that, that he had mm -hmm. experienced, but with this sense of faith within mm. it. She, she had actually been a poetess on earth that's well. what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, and she, he, he actually had read some of her poems while he was on earth, not Sorry. just in the spirit world. So Yes, that's yeah. what I meant. Yeah. While Fred was on earth, yeah. she had been writing poems. So I don't think he's, yes, we're yeah. about to discover poems that she writes in the spirit world. But at, until yeah. this point, he doesn't even know that. He yeah. just knows her as a poetess from earth. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, uh, he, does know that, he does know she's a, he's a poetess in the spirit world as well. Right. Because because he's met her before yes. and obviously known that she writes poems, but well, he does it's, go on to it's say the poems on earth that he's more connected yes. with. Yes, yeah. He does ask her though, 
uh, later in this chapter, he says, if then, if it were possible for you to write again. And she says, what do you mean write again? Yeah. I'll keep writing. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm not sure about that. Yeah. But yeah. 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 Um, he talks about now, the, I suppose, the basis of why this lady has been such a faith-filled and had such a relationship with God when on earth. Mm and uh, says something beautiful about her father. Do you see that there, just below where I read? Um, I can't find that. That's all right. (laughs) I'll read it out. Her father, who was a clergyman, cherished his creed as though it was a divinely silken thread for the purpose of leading pilgrims to their home, not as a barbed or iron fence that would tear and mangle the unwary. Mm. And I, that's a beautiful um, description of how someone might minister to people about religion and God, I yes. thought. Yeah. Um, so her education had been in the ministry of love as being the centre and circumference of all true religion. And under its ever-broadening and deepening influences, she had been carried out as upon the bosom of a majestic river into the infinite ocean of her God. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty beautiful descriptions of her faith. Yes, I, I feel he's being a little, uh, in, in this in this book, he's yeah. being a little, um, what's the best word, word to say? He's so, I feel he's a bit overemphasizing the issue. He's because sort of in glorifying the second, it a bit. Yeah, yeah, because in the second book, she begins to talk to him about um, her experience of religion on earth mm-hmm. and her contrast of the, her experience of religion on earth compared to the spirit world. And it's certainly not as good an experience as what he would tend to suggest (laughs) in that passage that you just read. But the reality is that she was taught about love. And and this is the thing that it it doesn't matter how many false things you're taught. Mm -hmm. As long as love is the dominant thing you're taught, then most almost all of the false things that you're taught at some point, they they all sort of disappear into insignificance. And this is why, like people who get hung up on theology, hung up on the, you know, the, the text, the, dogmatically yeah. on what this means or what that means, without considering love, mm-hmm. they are the people who struggle a lot in the spirit world, because they have never considered love and what love would do. Whereas the people who do not struggle, even though they might have been well educated and, and in fact, educated all of their life in a, in a faith but who have also been educated in love, Mm -hmm. they are the people who find the spirit world much more easily able to be acceptable or accepted by them and uh, and therefore find their life, their transition into that life a lot easier than the average person would have found it. Yeah. Yeah, and that was something I wanted to raise with you in the points for reflection on this chapter was this poetess... Uh, displays to me some beautiful qualities like uh, that we're about to explore but she has a faith Mm. uh, that is very strong in God and God's goodness which was established on earth yes and it seems to be that it was established through her not her religious education but her education in love Mm. that was perhaps linked to the religious education that she had but well I feel it had a lot to do with her father her yes. father, the clergyman father that she had, yeah. obviously he was not one of these dogmatic Christians, uh-huh. but rather a person who displayed their faith in, with love, right? And so because she grew up in an environment where firstly he was connected to God, but also secondly, he was connected to love in that process. Uh-huh. She grew up in an environment that was ideally suited for her development. And, then, and while she imbibed many false beliefs along the way, yeah they had little effect on her once she arrived in the spirit world and saw that, oh, a lot of the things I believed are wrong, but love is still the, the, the main stay thing. of my development. So Yeah, and mm. that, that mainstay enables her to have a strong faith that God is good. Mm. And this is a very important link, I feel, between our emotional work and our relationship with God, mm. in that while we're holding on to bitterness and while we're holding on to grief and fear, it's very difficult for us to have faith in a God that is good mm. because our experience is coloured by these emotions that we're holding on to. Whereas as we allow them to loosen up and be free and let go of them, 
it, it makes more space for love and therefore our faith in a loving God can grow mm. really firmly then. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So obviously she, her father believed in a loving God mm -hmm. and he would have had some, obviously, he did have some contradictions in his teachings because obviously he taught her the other Christian sides of faith, which she later in the second book demonstrates a, a way out of harmony for what yeah. she now knows to be love. Yep. But uh, um, obviously, though, she had this wonderful background in terms of her father trying to help her to have a relationship with God, but also helping her to practice the true religion, mm -hmm. the religion of love in yep. her day-to-day -day life when she was on earth. So when she passed into the spirit world, it was, it was easy for her to embrace the same kind of life. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Frederick does go on to wax lyrical about her <laughs> and her faith. Yes, yeah, which is uh, good. Because, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because obviously he's, he's, he's now re-meeting her again. Yes. And he, 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 at this stage, doesn't know a huge amount about her history. He knows more about her current state, and yeah. her current state is very good. It's very beautiful. And, yeah. And he talks about her faith and her love and um, how that's given him hope, really. Yes. Um, and rather than read all of that out, I'd like to continue in the chapter because I feel her words and actions later in the chapter actually demonstrate what he explains there anyway. Mm. So um, now they're about to commence a discussion and... Um, he wants to thank her for these poems that he read while on earth and that, that made such an impression upon him mm. and helped him really over some difficult times. Mm. And she says, but those thanks are not due to me, my brother. They are God's. He filled my cup so full of mercies that it must needs overflow. And whatever music sounded in my verses it was not of the cup, but in the falling blessings with which the goblet filled. Mm. And I suppose what I see her demonstrating there is a lot of humility and modesty. Mm. Um, and he goes on to sort of um, say, yeah, but you wrote the poems, basically. <laughs> he, he was so, basically he's suggesting that, like, I understand that God did all that, but, but you did take the action and write the poem, which is very true, yes, too. Yes, it is the true. The fact is that God did give her all of these gifts and all of the inspiration came from God and all these kind of things. But the reality is she also did use her will mm -hmm. in, a, in a loving manner to create these poems. And that did help him a lot. Of yeah. course, yeah. And if she had chosen to not use her will such, in such a way, then of course he wouldn't have had the benefit. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And she goes um, on then to sort of defer back to God and say, mm -hmm. well, but even then the thanks are doubly his, yeah. for did he not form the cup as well? So, yeah. so she's really... Did he not even form me, me. she was saying. Yeah, yeah. she's really honouring God as her creator. And yes. I do feel that as we embrace humility, um, while we do, we do acknowledge the use of our will and how we've used it, both mm -hmm. unlovingly and lovingly, mm -hmm. there is a strong um, feeling within us that's a feeling that is about honour of God and mm. what God has created in us and the potentials in us and, and I see that as a very beautiful quality that she's displaying there. Mm. Okay, so then they move on. He, he brings up this idea about the ideas of heaven that they had when they were on earth mm -hmm. and what it really is now. And mm -hmm. this is interesting yeah. part of the discussion, I think. Yeah. So um, she sa he says, uh, it is indeed, but yet this is scarcely your ideal of heaven. And she, she says, it's not my old ideal, but I can see um, where I, in common with all mankind, made a great mistake. Mm. And she says something here, we are not afraid to recognise facts or admit doubt here for fear of exposing some weakness in our teaching. So I can face the difficulty which would sometimes rise like the shadow of a fear as I contemplated the sudden transference of a soul from earth onto the presence of the king. So she's really saying, yeah, but from where I sit now, questioning what I believed before and recognising that it's different to what I believed is not really a hard deal now. Mm. Um, whereas when I was on earth, it was a little bit scary sometimes mm -hmm. to think, that the people who were about to pass were suddenly going to go to heaven, especially when she goes on to say, especially in some cases, 
the throne seemed a little bit too near to the deathbed. Like these people were sinners right up until the moment of their deathbed, according yeah. to religion. Then they repented and suddenly they were going to go to heaven. And yeah. that seemed a bit off kilter. Yeah. Yeah, here, isn't it, To I feel there's a couple of points she's really mm -hmm. raising. One is the point of fear. Mm -hmm. Like on earth, in almost every religious faith, the holy books suggest that there are good reasons to be afraid of your, you know, of choices that you make on earth, mm -hmm. right? So, so they engender or encourage fear in many cases. And unfortunately, it's fear of God that they're encouraging. In fact, it's quite openly stated in the Christian faith that you should fear God. Yep. And, and of course, there is never any need to ever fear somebody who loves. loves. You. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there was no need to fear God at all. And, and yet there is this sort of encouragement on earth to fear God. And, and therefore, when you fear someone, you are, you are particularly afraid of what kind of decisions you might make and what impact that might have. And then there's the second issue of dogma, mm -hmm. like in terms of what you're taught. And what you're taught does have a large degree uh, of influence over what you th believe is going to happen to you. And, and looking back is a lot easier than looking forward, of course. Yes. So for the person who's passed and now realises that God wasn't the punishing God that they believed God to be, and they also realise that all the threats of all the things that would have happened to them that never happened to them after they've passed for doing what they thought were all were told was wrong from, yeah. a, from a dogma or theological perspective, they, they then see that they had nothing to fear. Mm -hmm. So she, she basically sees that there's nothing to fear now, but, but of course on the earth, it's different. You know, a lot of times most people, when they consider their passing, they do have a lot to fear. And this is the case even with most people who have what we classify as a faith, mm -hmm. like a religious faith. Most of them do have a lot of fear about passing because there isn't a large degree of accepted knowledge on the earth which would help them go through the passing without fear. Mm. Yeah. Is she not also there saying that this, um, there's commonly a fear on earth to expose what could potentially be a weakness or something doesn't match up here? Correct. Uh, we're, we can't admit that because that might be the, the stumbling block that crea creates the big downfall for everything. So yes. um, she's saying... And you see and this a lot on earth, don't you, where yeah. people manipulate what's being said to another because they're afraid of what the person may do with the truth. Yeah. Like this is one of the main concerns I get from religious leaders who email us sometimes because they are concerned that with if I tell people that God is only a God of love, that that will then cause people to go and be bad. And I'm going, well, so you're, you're wanting to tell them that God is a God that punishes to try to make them be good. Mm. But it's not true. Mm. God doesn't punish. So, so so you're willing to tell them a lie in order to force someone to be good. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Surely the truth is that God doesn't punish them and, and God loves them. But the truth also is there's, a, there's laws that have results if you break them. Yeah. And if, surely if you told them both of those truths, you would have nothing to worry about, mm -hmm. you know, whether a person chose to go and do the wrong thing or not. Yeah. And, and this is where I find a lot of religious people, they almost have this arrogant position where they feel withholding information from other people or telling people false, falsities is a way of making the person good. Mm. And I can't see how this relationship can ever occur. If you tell somebody a lie, there is no way that in the future that lie will not be found out. Yeah. So that they will discover this lie and then see what happens yeah. to the individual. You will yeah. see a destruction of their faith yeah. under those circumstances. So that's not the way to create faith in a person, no. to tell them a bunch of lies in, in order to force them to be good boys and girls. And as, as the poetess so beautifully demonstrates in this chapter, and I feel Frederick in his whole journey, and I feel even in my own journey, building faith, it's a process. And there are going to be questions and you're going to have to ask questions and seek to discover answers. Mm -hmm. So you're always, you're going to have to get used to this thing of not having all the answers, Correct. but building faith upon experience mm -hmm. and being open to learning new things. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how true faith is built. Mm -hmm. So if we exist in a belief system that doesn't allow for questions and doesn't allow us for 
uh, reasoning logically and saying, well, that doesn't match up, so we need to find an answer, mm. then we can't really build faith beyond a certain point, can no. we? No, and it's not real faith. No. Because real faith is based on reality. It's not yeah. based on lies. So any so-called faith that's based on lies will is not faith at all. Mm. It's just a figment of your imagination yeah. in the end. Yeah. And it, all figments of our imagination eventually disappear. Yeah. So, so it's a very dangerous thing for faith to build faith upon lies because mm -hmm. there's no such thing as a faith built upon lies. Yeah. Faith can only be built on reality, on truth. Yeah. And, and this is why it's so essential to focus on the truth, even if you think there might be a negative consequence for telling somebody the truth. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like a, a married couple where the husband goes out and cheats on his wife. He obviously believes now telling his wife is going to create a negative consequence, right? So he withholds the information. Well, that's that, that there is no real truth in the entire relationship now and there is no real faith in the entire relationship now. Mm -hmm. She really has a false confidence in the, in the fidelity of, of her husband mm -hmm. and, and if he had told her the truth, he, she also has the de decision to make of whether she should forgive or leave. Mm -hmm. And she could have, and she can decide those things. But, but if he withholds the truth, now the entire relationship is false. Mm -hmm. There is no real uh, positive outcome that's in, going to occur in the future. Sooner or later, whether she's on the earth or later in the spirit world, she'll find out that, she che uh, that he cheated. Yeah. And he, she will have to go through the emotions associated with yeah. that. And so will he. Yeah. And all he's trying to do is prevent that from happening now. Yeah. And, so, and, and so telling a person the truth under all circumstances is the best course mm -hmm. of action. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is what they're really saying. Is it, like, don't withhold truth just because you're worried about what the person will do with that truth. How, what kind of decisions they will make. What kind of theological stance they will then take. Don't worry about all those things. Just tell the truth and let the truth destroy what's the error, mm -hmm. destroy the false, destroy the lies, and in the end build a real faith, a faith that stands on a foundation. Mm, mm. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So they're in their discussion, the earth-based idea of heaven mm -hmm. versus the truth. And then actually they move on to talking about faith. Mm. Because really she's talking about how on earth there were questions there were, but they were she was afraid to even look at them but how is it possible that someone would just pass all these i believe she's implying in her in this in the paragraph that follows the sentence i read that how is it that there can be so many varied people in so many varied states and all of a sudden they're all going to pass and, all and be singing <laughs> singing with the angels and she 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 talks yeah. about um there was always a kind of dread that one might hear a discord <laughs> from some inharmonious voice which had not yet had time to learn the song <laughs> which is a is kind of a cute way of saying like yeah. you know some of us have been in this feeling for God and relationship with God for a lot of years and other people are suddenly entering it and how's that all going to work out once once we're all past and what's going to look like and yeah. and and not only that I was thinking um, she's also sort of alluding to the fact that on earth quite often lots and lots of people have doubts but no nobody wants to voice them mm -hmm. <laughs> so they all want to sing the same song and, uh, but they're all feeling like they should be probably singing a different one, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and I feel there's this uh, illusion she's got there about particularly those words that you read mm -hmm. where, where the reality is that a, a lot of the times yeah. we're singing a song that somebody else taught us that we still don't really believe and we suspect there's something wrong with it. And yeah. you, we find many people like this in religious faith. Yes. And, and often it's that person who's the most angry. Yeah because they are so afraid to express their own doubts about their own faith yep. that, uh, that any confrontation of any truth with them causes them just to go into rage rather than going, oh, you know, that's the feeling I had all my life. Well, it's, oops, it's, it's a way, isn't it, of defending, like when we are afraid of something and we don't want to feel it, we don't want to have that fear exposed in any way. Mm. And so then we will act to shut down anyone who might reflect to us that same fear or trigger that feeling yeah. and so many people who are very angry 
are actually harbouring, well, all people who are very angry, angry yeah. are harbouring a lot of fears. And, and a lot of doubts, generally, yeah. about their own faith. And this, you're right, that, that's really what she's saying, isn't it? Mm. That it's like, we were all kind of hanging out there, but everyone was afraid to do this thing that she says that she's no longer afraid of, to ask yeah. questions and admit doubts. Everyone was afraid of standing out and being different. And in fact, that is one of the major reasons why people stay in their religious faith. So just yep. afraid to be different to the, how they were brought up, their family, their friends and everything else. Yep. They're just afraid to be different. And so they, they're afraid to sing a song that's a different line yes. than, yep. than the persons that, they, that uh, surround them. Yeah. Mm. And that's a way that growth is really shut down on the planet, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's by questioning and asking and and seeking that growth happens. And yeah. when you enter a group or a faith where nobody's asking any questions anymore, yeah. it's gonna stay stagnant. Yeah. yeah, and it reminds me of one of the Paget messages where, the, where Paget asked John why, or John came to Paget to channel a message about why it is that the most people stay in their religious faith. Mm -hmm. And John made some funny comments about it in that message. One of those comments he made was, well, you would think that asking them why, they'd be able to tell you. But the reality is no one on earth really knows the reason why they stay in their own faith. And because most of them don't or question end it. up not agreeing or, yeah. or questioning it at some yeah. point. And, and then he talked about the power of the family mm -hmm. and the power of social conditioning and the effects of social conditioning on a person remaining in a certain way of life. Yeah. And this is a large reason why most people don't ask questions is because the social conditioning around them or surrounding them is that you don't ask questions because that means you're, you're expressing doubts now or you don't have faith now and there's a problem with that. We've got problems with that because internally I've got a problem with it because I know I've got that problem <laughs> <laughs> and we, don't wanna, we didn't want to deny that. So, so we eventually try to force each other into maintaining the company line, as yeah. the saying goes. Yeah. And, and this is one of the primary reasons why there is very slow change on the earth. Mm -hmm because everyone wants to maintain the company line, but the company line needs to be thrown out and we need to get a new line. And, and this is the problem with why we stay in religious faith that have, we ourselves have grown beyond and also why we stay in, in dogmatic theological concepts without accepting that love should be the term, determining key. Yes, mm. and I'm thinking now of just personal experiences of both of us where we've had to leave the family line of the religious group mm -hmm. um, because love compelled us differently. Correct. Um, yep. And the challenges that that has brought to each of us. And yeah. in each case, um, any person who leaves on the earth, it seems, who leaves this sort of company line, family line, religious line, yeah. They eventually get attacked, unfortunately, by the others. But that, um, that attack is a demonstration of the fact that the others have not yet learned to love. Exactly. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, does no, it? No, not at because all. Because if love was the dominant uh, thing that the system was based on, then a person questioning or leaving would not affect the love within the, right. the And they'd be free to discover. Yes. Within, you know, we, there would be no boundaries of theological argument that would cause them to pause. Yeah. They, would, they would ask the questions that their doubt demands an answer yeah. for, and they would allow the answers to come from all sources, not just from the sources that are acceptable to, to the group, yes. to the social society that, in which they live. Yeah. And this is, these are all the limitations that we experience here on earth to discovering new truth. Mm, yeah. Mm. yeah, okay, so now um, the poetess goes on to talk about faith. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about the different ideas between heaven as they were on earth and in the spirit world now. Now she's talking about the different idea that she had of faith when on earth mm -hmm. and that many people have on earth mm -hmm. to what it really is now for her. Yes. Um, and I'm in love with this paragraph. So <laughs> can't fire away. Um, now I can base, uh, now I can best compare the earth idea of heaven to the experience of the mountaineer who at daybreak, starting from the inn, takes a longing look at the peak he desires to reach. Faith takes one mighty leap and stands like a monarch upon the towering height, laughing at the toilers who are climbing, resting and anon, slipping so far behind. Yep. 
But faith is not the tourist and in its gigantic leap has carried forward nothing but its own imagination. Mm. He who exercised it is still among his fellow travellers and in spite of it will be compelled to climb the steep ascent with careful tread or he will never reach his goal. Mm. Yet faith is good for it gives by its confidence of success buoyancy to the step and conquers the thousand doubts which others will suffer owing to the difficulties of the way. Mm. Mm -hmm. And We see this a lot for people right now, don't we, who have been listening to Divine Truth for five or six years or something like that. We see that for many of them, there is sort of, many of them are not dividing into two camps, as mm -hmm. we say. There's one camp who still has faith that, that God is good, that love is good, that you know and it gives them confidence that even though it's difficult right now and even though they've got a thousand doubts right now about it they're going to keep stepping forward and keeping stepping up the mountain mm -hmm. and having as the goal at the end that at one moment with god condition and then there's the others who basically didn't have faith in the beginning and were doing it for other reasons and they just find one doubt and they're off mm -hmm. they're gone mm -hmm. they, they disappear mm -hmm. and uh, and I feel faith is, a, is a, a very important quality for that reason. It helps you determine within yourself what is the most holiest of aspirations and then it helps you stick by the desire for that aspiration rather than leaving it because some doubt or some pressure comes upon you. And, and that's really what she's describing here. Faith is the thing that imagines you at the end but also keeps you going through the middle, mm -hmm. through the hard parts, the, 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 the darkness, if you like, that sometimes you need to tread through. You could liken it with the mountain, the steep bits and difficult bits that you are quite afraid of. Yeah. Uh, the faith draws you through that because you want the end goal so much. Yeah. And, and I find that most people seem to divide into those two camps, whether they have that kind of faith that's going to keep them going or they have a faith that's just something that somebody told them. They go, oh, that's a good idea. And off they go and they get a quarter way up the mountain. They decide, oh, this is all too hard. I think I'll go back down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also I, I see the parallels there between, uh, say, I, in Islam and in Christianity, mm. there's a lot of people in those faiths who believe that, just have to believe that Muhammad or Jesus, just believe in those and even say a specific sentence mm. and you are saved, mm. basically. And mm. so this faith of like, here I am at the bottom of the mountain, I'll say this one sentence and boom, I'm at the top. Yeah. Whereas... So that's not uh, true either. That's not true, but that's a very <laughs> earthly conception of, of what faith is about. Mm. And mm. I know some interviewers have said to you, oh, so, you know, what about this when someone questions this or what about this or that? And I suppose you think you've just got to have faith. And to which you're always like, what? <laughs> <laughs> because um, there's this idea that any question you have, you should subdue and just have faith in the, in the other thing. Mm. And, and I suppose I hear... And, and can I take that by extension? A lot, a lot of these people, these media people and others go, you're saying you're Jesus. So basically what you're saying to people is, They've got to believe everything you say, and, and if, if, they, if they don't, they've just got to have faith in it. And no, I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I'm saying completely the opposite to that. You know, exactly. That, but that, that idea that comes from somewhere, doesn't it? And yes. it comes from a lot of um, people avoiding questions in whatever faith they have. Correct. Uh, and just saying we need to just believe. And, and it also comes from the presumption that some person who may know more than yourself about a certain path then expects you to follow their path. And that's, n that's not an accurate presumption. If the person who knows more than you about a certain path um, loves you, they will not expect you to follow the path. You're allowed to make digressions and diversions and you're allowed to go right off the edge of a cliff if you want. You know, yeah. They're not going to stop, stop you. They might, they might say some things to you to help you prevent such disasters, but at the end of the day, they're not going to tell you or threaten you and say to you that you've just got to have faith in what they say. Mm. Faith is based on real things, not on what a person says. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I suppose that I find that very beautiful that she's beginning to describe faith as something that aids you, the truth of faith and the truth of what she knows faith to be now that she's in the spirit world mm. is that it's something that aids you on your journey. And mm. as you outlined very well before, it 
it's something that it doesn't mean having faith just gets you to the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. It's something that helps you and assists you and sustains you on a journey that you're on. Mm -hmm. And she goes on later in the chapter to say some very beautiful things about what it is to progress. Mm -hmm. And she's really saying faith is your partner in progression. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, if, and I feel the biggest thing we need to have faith about is God's goodness. Mm -hmm. God's existence and God's goodness. Without faith in those two things, we really are probably never going to ever become at one with God. We're never going to receive divine love to the point of at one with God unless we have those two faiths, if you like, yeah. faith in God and faith that God exists and faith that God is good yeah. and that, you know, that I want to have a relationship with, with my parent God. Mm -hmm. And these, these faiths are, are rare, actually. There, there are not many people who have that kind of faith. And... Um, Unfortunately, because of that, most people then browbeat people into a, a semblance or a facade of faith yeah. by using theological dogma or something like that to convince a person that they should do something or threats or bribery to convince them that they should do something. Threats like you'll go to hell if you don't yeah. and bribery like you'll be in heaven if you do yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and these kind of threats and bribery are not good motivators for a person to develop true faith in the goodness of God. Mm. Yeah. And they're not the sort of um, things that will sustain us on a journey of progression. Definitely not, mm. no. Yeah, so uh, this is where um, Fred now brings up the idea of if she could write again and, and she says, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm writing all the time. Yeah. And she says another important thing about progression here. She says, genius of every kind in the mortal state can only experience its birth. The growth, expansion and fruition remain for us. Mm. One note of music was once breathed below by, by angel lips, but earth has never heard the fullness of her song. And she goes on with a lot of metaphor mm. about that. But mm. I felt again there she was talking about progression. She's saying everything that you start to grow here only continues. Mm. And um, anything that you're good at on earth, you're just going to, if it's in harmony with love, it's going to become more beautiful and more mm. expansive. And I think that's the qualifier, isn't it? Obviously, if, if it's, it's in harmony with love. Yeah. Like, like I've often pointed out, you know, if you're an accountant here on earth, well, <laughs> I don't think you're going to grow too much in the spirit world sta staying an accountant yeah. because there won't be many things to count, <laughs> particularly won't be any money to count. There'll yeah. be other things perhaps to count, but you won't grow in... in the, the idea of the monetary system or anything like because there is no such thing mm -hmm. in the spirit world. So as long as the thing exists as God created it, you will experience growth. Yep. So if you think of art, music, you know, poetry, words, all of these things uh, continue to expand uh, in their growth. You know, the expression of emotions to other people, emotions themselves grow, intellectual knowledge you grow on all sorts of different subjects. But obviously there's certain subjects where there is no growth. Yes. Uh, but, but they are subjects where that people on earth have created independent of and in the end against God's desires. Because when I say against God's desires, in the sense that God uh, God's laws eventually destroy such things mm. as a person progresses. So there are things that as a person progresses that get destroyed in the progress. Yes. And then there's things, of course, that are everlasting that grow and continue to expand in a person's progress. And that's something that she says later in the chapter as well, that love just continues to amplify everything of beauty. Yes. And, yeah. and obviously she's a woman who values love and feels mm. strongly about love. Yeah. So then she goes on to share a poem. Mm. Um, and what if I read each part of the poem and then we discuss it? Sure. Um, so it's called Waiting. Waiting now upon the threshold, just within the porch of life, safe from all the storms and tempests, hushed the discord and the strife. Stilled the heart with its wild beatings, calmed the hot and fevered brain, waiting now and resting sweetly till the master comes again. So this is her beginning to describe where she feels that she's at in, in her progression, really, in this state that she's in right now. And 
would you like to make a comment or will I just continue? Well, I, I feel she's making a comment about a place in the spirit world that most people arrive at, and it's this, this borderland of the second sphere in the first sphere, summer land, if you like to call it that, um, where most people reach this state where they feel some sense of rest. Mm -hmm. And they realise that there's a lot ahead of them now, but they also realise that a lot of the pain of the past has dissipated to a large degree. Yeah. And so it's like a... And, and, and not, obviously not all people who pass instantly experience this. In fact, the majority don't. It's after many years of being in the spirit world that they experience this location mm -hmm. for, for most people. But once they experience this location, it's a very restful location because it, you realise that you're never going to go back to the turmoil and the strife of your past life. Mm -hmm. And while you may have to visit it emotionally at times in order to resolve things, you, you won't ever be drawn back into living that life again. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a very um, comforting place yeah. to be. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. Waiting where the rippling wavelets of, ri of life's river lave my feet, washing off the stains of travel, ere the master I may, meet, I may greet. Till the voice is full and mellow and I learn the sweet new song, till the discord is forgotten that disturbed my peace so long. Waiting till the wedding garment and the bridal wreath is here, till our father's feast is ready and the bridegroom shall appear. Till the seeds of life have blossomed and the harvest home we sing, gathering up my life's long labours for my bridal offering. So what does that make you cry, baby? <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes me cry because you're my bridegroom yeah. and she's referring to you. <laughs> yeah. But other times when I've read this poem, I feel a bit cranky because I get <laughs> <laughs> annoyed that you're so often referred to as everyone's bridegroom. Mm. <laughs> you're the symbol of the church of the bridegroom and the church is the bride or the person in the, in the faith is the bride and you're the bridegroom. And mm. I suppose there's, there's a lot more in this poem for me than um, uh, perhaps for the casual reader. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, like you are, you are my bride so, and nobody else is. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent a lot of time waiting on earth. Yeah. Yeah. In the first century, you mean. But I also see that it's a very beautiful place that she's at where she's feeling she's longing for God and she's longing um, to be in a state to, to meet you, which is a state of love. Mm. And so really, as I said earlier, she's using all of these metaphors and analogies to, to convey where she is in terms of her state. Mm. Um, so she's, she's longing and she's desiring to take the next steps and to grow, continue her growth in mm. love. Yeah. And we certainly have met. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it, it's also uh, often people speak of meeting you. Also, it's about of reaching a state where they feel that they will be worthy to meet you or a condition in love, isn't mm. it? That's what they refer to. Which I find to. a little sad sometimes. So yeah. the, the reality is that there have been many people who have met me way before they were in that kind of condition she's describing. Um, and some of them have been appreciative of the meeting and others have not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I find it a little sad sometimes that the biblical analogies are used rather than it being um, a, a deeper understanding of what's really happening, which is their growth, growth in love. Mm -hmm. and, and Elel does have this growth in love. Yeah. But, but even at this stage, she is still a little too focused, I feel, on, you know, the sort of reaching my condition rather than seeing it as an everlasting condition. But in, again, in the later books, you do see that opinion change in her. Well, and so, even later so, on in this chapter, yeah, and later she, on even in the chapter. she begins to refer... Uh, We'll get to yes. that anyway, to so the ideas of What I find with her poetry, it's very interesting because she's really writing about stages in her life. Does that make sense? Yes. So she's not really writing about what she feels right now. 
She's writing about the time after she passed and she reached the top of the first sphere, as I've described, mm -hmm. and, and found that restful place where now she could build the rest of her life upon. Yeah. And, and it was still quite tainted by her earth-based beliefs, yes. but um, she understood that it was about growing in love. Yeah. Um, now, of course, her beliefs are very different. And so we need to understand that every one of these poems is like a snapshot. Yes. Every one of her poems is like a snapshot in time rather than a description of her current feelings. Yeah. yeah. And, and that is natural and that is again this theme that happens in the chapter where mm. she's quite openly saying, I'm still learning the lessons of love. Mm. Uh, every new step I take, and there's a beautiful quote later on in the chapter where she says that, um, each new step I take is like a new revelation in love for me and that's wonderful mm. and so this is not supposed to be depicting her in a perfected state no. it's just where she is yes. yeah. yeah oh tis not as men would teach us just one step from earth to god passing through the death veil to him in the garb that earth we trod Call to praise him while aweary, or to sing while yet the voice with love's farewell sob is broken. Could we fitly thus rejoice? No, we wait to learn the music, wait to rest our weary feet, wait to learn to sweep the harp strings, ere the master we shall meet. Wait to tune our newfound voices to the sweet seraphic song, wait to learn the time and measure, but the time will not be long. Wait to understand the glory that will shortly be revealed till our eyes can bear the brightness when the book shall be unsealed. Oh, the vision would overpower us if it suddenly were given. So we wait in preparation in the vestibule of heaven. Mm. So she, she's saying a lot of things about Again, it's this misconceptions on earth. We don't just suddenly pass over and woohoo, we're with God. We're learning, we're growing, and there is this time of waiting and resting and, mm. and, um, and letting go of the earth life, really, she's saying, isn't she? And also becoming, I suppose you could say, uh, this higher concept of the vestibule of heaven, which is basically the interim between the earth and heaven. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that she had already realised, which Frederick uh, or Afra had not yet realised, is that they were standing not in heaven, but in the vestibule of heaven, the area of, of the spirit world that prepares you for heaven, yeah. for, prepares you for gaining the kind of love that is required to live in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, um, she's showing that it's sort of like a probationary period, <laughs> <laughs> if you like, yeah. where a person learns new things and in the process of being a learner, goes through this p period of probation or, or, or in this vestibule of heaven where it's, a, where it's an in-between in state. Yes. Uh, sometimes, you know, legends refer to it as like the twilight zones and all those <laughs> kind of things, but it's not like that at all. But, uh, but it is a state in between the earth and the heaven. Yeah. And in fact, one of the reasons why the Catholic Church came up with the concept of purgatory, yeah. even though the concept does not exist in the Bible, was because there were different people in the Catholic Church who had received inspiration from the spirit mm -hmm. world, demonstrating that there was, there was certain areas in the spirit world which were like preparations for the entry into heaven. Yeah. And, uh, and of course they misapplied that, they sort of, uh, and unfortunately... With a lot of fear. And with a lot of fear, yeah. and you know, you had to pay to get out yeah, purgatory, yeah, yeah. purgatory and so forth. Yeah. But, but the reality is that there are these in-between states where a person is not yet in heaven, but is also not in the condition that's in the hells. Yeah. And, and, and so it's a gradual transition mm. between those two states. Well, and really we could say everywhere from the second to that seventh sphere is really that state. Correct. It, it's, a, it's a progression that, yeah. it's, that people are going through yeah. in preparation, in learning these lessons. In, yes. In, um, learning time and measure, learning how to make the beautiful music of heaven yes. as she's painting the metaphor. It's yeah. like getting taught how to sing. You, know, yeah. you, learn, yeah. you learn the song, the words, the melody. The, Wowzers. Yeah, eventually getting the into heaven is based on singing voice, <laughs> I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> You're a good singer in heaven, I can remember. <laughs> yeah, it's all affected by emotions, hey. Mm. Okay. Uh, 
So, again, Frederick now wants to talk about the qualities that he sees her displaying while she's even saying the poem. Mm. And um, it's possibly a deep injustice the way I read the poem, considering what she, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> what she displayed and how she did it. But yes. yeah. uh, um, he talks a lot about seeing in her faith, humility and longing. Yes. And I thought they were, you know... And also deep trust in God's goodness. Like yeah. this underlying theme of trusting God's goodness, even though you know you're a work in progress, you haven't made full progression yet, you haven't, you know, might not even be changing very much yet, mm -hmm. but, but you know that God is good at least. You know that God is love and you know that God loves you and you know that that's the thing you want to experience. You want to experience this God who you've come to know often in the spirit world for the first time because most people on earth don't know God very well at all and also have a lot of very harsh beliefs about God, you know, that God's punishing and wrathful and so forth. And she's given up those beliefs and now she has this just this strong knowing that, no, God is good yeah. and everything about God is good and, and I'm aspiring to get closer to God in every yeah. moment of my life. Yeah. And that's how she was living her life. And she's very unassuming in the way that she's presenting herself and her poetry and, mm -hmm. and, and everything. She's, she's really, as you said, focused on this, mm. this goal and uh, not very caught up in herself. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and she remarks that aren't these better truths to know? Isn't, aren't those sweeter thoughts than the mistaken ideas that we had on her? Yes. So yeah. she thinks it's much better than just like popping your clogs and going to be with God yeah. to, to have this process of learning and growing and waiting and resting and yeah. all these things. In, in the next book, The Life Elysian, she, she often says things like, um, you know, she compares the thoughts that she had of God while on earth with the thoughts she had of God and the life in the spirit world when she's in the spirit world yeah. and and one's like the the sun compared to the night you know yes. in terms of how she conceived things yeah and and this is the thing too is that the reality is the majority of people on earth have a very dim if any real knowledge uh, about of course they educated every night as we talked about in previous chapters yeah they were educated every night about what the sleep you know what the spirit world is like mm -hmm. but because of this denial that we're talking about in this chapter this really strong denial they have they shut down the recollection of anything to do with the sleep state. So therefore yeah. they shut down the recollection of any goodness that God has whatsoever. Yeah. And so they have a very dim, if, if any at all, sometimes it's a very dark rather than just a dimly light yeah. conception of what the spirit world will be. And I actually just, I'm picking up on it because of the language you just used right then, but yeah. I, I made note of a, um, a verse from 1 Corinthians. It's not directly referenced in this chapter, yes. but reading the chapter, it just uh, was sort of pops out at popping you. out yeah. at me, yeah. which is, uh, it's 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Yeah. And it's very famous, yes. um, but it's about love. Yes. But uh, I won't read the full um the full verse but just the part that I'm referring to um, it, in 1 Corinthians 13 it talks about love and you know if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love and it goes on to mm -hmm. love is patient and kind and all of these things and um, at the in verse 12 it says I see it as through a dark glass, uh, glass, sorry, glass darkly. So in, yeah. in this version it says, um, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And in other translations it talks about seeing through a glass darkly, so mm -hmm. not seeing the full full picture. And mm -hmm. I often think of that verse when thinking about progression and and mm -hmm. uh, our progression in the spirit world, because we don't we don't see clearly. And when you understand a bit of the history of mirrors, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, in the first century, the mirrors that you looked at weren't very clear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they weren't like today, where you see everything in a lot of detail, you'd often see distortions and there'd be little flecks everywhere and there'd be all of these, yeah. uh, you know, different uh, yep. shapes coming out because of the imperfection in the glass and so forth. 
and yet, and that's the illusion, the, 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 what's being alluded to here. Yeah. The, the fact that uh, uh, at the time the mirrors weren't very clear and yes. you couldn't really see yourself that clearly when you examined yourself unless you had a very expensive yeah. <laughs> mirror. And, uh, and, and that's the case on earth for the majority of us, isn't it? Like we, we don't see things clear, we don't see love clearly. And we don't see any other quality, usually inside or outside of ourselves, very clearly. Mm. Um, we have the opportunity to, yeah. but it requires growth in love in order to do so. And most people don't undertake that growth because yeah. it's not considered important yeah. on earth. Yeah. And this is a problem. Yeah, and I often feel about that point of at one moment is when we will see clearly and see face to face. Yes. Yeah. And